We are concluding our series on building up. We have been um, looking over the last few weeks uh, about building up in a world that tears down. We've seen that our society tends to thrive on tearing others down. We say demeaning and despicable things. More often we type those on, on posts and in forums and comment sections and and then we run away, so we won't have to engage in the conversation. Does this sound familiar? Maybe you don't do it, but you've seen it at least, yes? But that is not who we are called to be. And it is certainly not how we should be. And it will not change the world for the better. And so we have been exploring over these last few weeks how we intentionally bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ in a world in which so much rhetoric and conversation is critical and condescending and just plain mean. Now we started this series um, uh, on week one at the very beginning, Jesus tells us that we are to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we see that the first part of loving our neighbors is loving ourselves. And I'm pretty sure we heard this in all three services. Now downstairs, they've been calling it out, so somebody's going to have to call out. Um, we are created in the book of Genesis. We hear about how we are created, and we are created not good, but very good. Dwight was here at the 815 service. Good job. <laughs> we are very good. You are very good. And you are worthy to be loved. And you are worthy to love. And that is what we are called to do. To love ourselves because we are very good. And to love others who are also very good. The next week we learned that our words are powerful, powerful enough to murder hearts and to scar souls. And then on week three we discovered where much of our trouble lies with our words. It's in our tongues or in our fingertips as we type those words. And then last week we, we turned a little bit to see how we could then change, do different, be different, to build up rather than to tear down. And so today we're going to look at what our ultimate goal is as followers of Jesus Christ. Our scripture lesson today comes to us from the letter to the Romans. Um, it is, um, Romans is in the New Testament. And today I'm going to be reading to you from a different translation. Most of the time I read straight from the New Revised Standard Version. That is the version that I learned to read from in seminary. It is very scholarly. It's a beautiful text. That's what I read from. Except for today. Uh, <laughs> because this is uh, one of my favorite passages of scripture. And I love the translation that Eugene Peterson offers in the message. And so while I would invite you to open up your Bibles and turn to Romans, it, it's not going to say the same thing. So now I'm going to uh, invite you to open your bulletin if you would like to follow along. Uh, the message translation is in that. Or maybe you want to uh, focus your eyes on the cross or on the stained glass. Or maybe just take a deep breath and close your eyes today to hear the word of God for our lives. This is uh, Romans chapter 12 beginning at verse 9 and then going through verse 18. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sorry for a second, I forgot how that went because I usually just do all the parts myself downstairs. <laughs> forgot you all know. This passage, as I said, is is one of my very favorites. Um, if you if you ever 
look in a Bible that's not the message that has uh, headers for sections. This one is often, and in multiple translations I've found, it's often um, titled as Marks of a True Christian. And if you... Um, if you do not specify a passage of scripture to be read at your funeral, I'm going to time out for a second. Go ahead and specify a passage of scripture to be read at your funeral. Write it down in your Bible, stick it somewhere, hand it to a family member. But if you do not have a passage of scripture already picked out that you want to share or to have shared at your um, celebration of life service, if you don't have one of those picked out, and I can tell that your family really loved you, or if I really loved you, I will read this passage of scripture most of the time. It is a very favorite of mine. It was read at our wedding, and I hope someday it can be read at my celebration of life service. It was the theme passage the year that I was the preacher at junior and senior high assemblies. Now I'll tell you, the, the theme passage here was, the, they used the don't fake it part. And I remember, I mean, this was 15, 16 years ago when I was the speaker at junior and senior high assembly. And I remember going out to West Town Mall to like try to buy some clothes that looked more like teenagers. I don't know. I wanted to fit in a little better. And then as I was like looking for things and not finding anything that I liked that I still felt was appropriate for myself, I remembered that the passage was don't fake it. And so then I just wore my preacher clothes. <laughs> I told them that. <laughs> but this passage is one um, that I hope to live into, to love from the center of who I am, to not fake it. See, friends, this passage tells us how we are supposed to live as followers of Jesus Christ, how to live like Jesus did. Paul even quotes in here a, a bit of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and Sermon on the Plain, because depending on, he has a little bit of Mark, I mean, a little bit of Matthew and a little bit of Luke here. He says this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And Paul has taken some of those words and added them in here. Bless your enemies enemies, no cursing under your breath. Marks of a true Christian. Mark Reasoner, who is professor of biblical studies at Bethel University, says this about this passage. He says, genuine love is the deepest theme in this section of Romans. This helps us see that genuine love is not just being nice to people. Genuine love has a moral orientation toward the good. When we show love toward someone, we are moving them toward God's goodness. He writes, to love someone is not simply to cater to specific likes and dislikes of that person. It is rather to act toward them in ways that helps them experience more of God's goodness. To love from our very center helps someone else experience the goodness of God. My grandparents, my maternal grandparents, my mama's mama and daddy were great influences on my life. And people who, when I read this passage from um, the letter to the Romans, I see them. My grandfather um, owned a, uh, a John Deere franchise for a little while. Before it was John Deere, it was just Atkins Brothers equipment. And after John Deere, it's just been Atkins equipment. It's a farm farm store <laughs> equipment. And my, my grandfather only closed his shop one day a year. It was not Christmas. It was watermelon day. <laughs> Y'all have watermelon day? <laughs> July 4th. <laughs> uh, that was the only day that he closed because he knew that the farmer's work was never done and they didn't get a vacation day and farmers were counting on him to make sure their equipment was running if something broke and needed to be fixed. Lots of times you could find him out in the middle of somebody's field. The person wouldn't even be there. They've already called and said, you know, my baler's out in the middle of the field, come fix it. And he would go fix it. Now I will, I told this at 815 and I tried to think of a better way to say it, but there's not one. I think financially my grandfather was probably not the greatest businessman. But he sure was Christ-like. 
Because if you needed a piece of equipment and you didn't have any money, he would take a trade. My grandfather, for most of my childhood, drove a brown Chevette. You remember those? It was like a little thing. Uh, but it wasn't all the way brown. It had one panel of red on the front. I guess where it had gotten fixed from somebody. But he drove that because somebody couldn't pay for their tractor that they needed. And so they traded him a car. And he drove their broken down Chevette instead. There was a point for, I don't know, around a year or so that my brother and my cousin and I had the best toy. We had a real school bus <laughs> because somebody needed some equipment and they had a school bus instead of cash. Now, that may not make him financially the greatest businessman, but people sure did love and respect him in our community because he loved and respected them. Before uh, I was born, um, my grandfather was the teacher of uh, the children's Sunday school class at the church that they attended. And often he would have Sunday school not at the church, but uh, up the hill. Everything's hills there. Matt knows. It's... <laughs> So we have, we're not streets, we have a road and a hill. But up the hill from the church was our property. And he often had Sunday school there because he could have cookouts and he could feed the children who were not getting fed. And my granny Rachel, who I, you know I love because if you've been here any moment, you, you know her story, some of you. You know at least her story enough to know my daughter Rachel. <laughs> that is how much I loved her. But my granny Rachel, who also worked at um, the John Deere, I still call it that even though it hasn't been one of those for a long time, but you know when you grow up with something, it's the same, right? Um, but she also worked at the John Deere. My grandmother um, worked at that shop so much that um, a week and a half before she died, I went to visit her and she was starting hospice. And I got up that morning and there was a note left for me in the kitchen that said, biscuit and bacon are in the toaster oven. I'll be back when the nurse comes. That was the hospice nurse. She went to work the morning the hospice nurse was coming. She also made everybody else breakfast who was down there. But my granny Rachel loved her community and she, she loved those farmers too. But she also loved people and creatures that no one ever cared for or paid attention to. One of the things that my granny did every day was feed the crows. Now you might set out bird seed for the robins and the cardinals and all the pretty things. Have you ever fed the crows on purpose? <laughs> my mama and my uncle still, still do because that's what they were taught to feed even the birds that nobody likes or cares about. She also um, fed a person that nobody seemed to like or cared about. There's a, a man who lived up this hill, not this hill, but this one, uh, <laughs> who um, when uh, either he had, he had no family or he had alienated all of his family. I'm not really sure. Um, but when we had a holiday meal or a cookout or we just had some leftovers, my granny would make him a couple of plates. And most of the time, my uncle would drive up the hill and, and take him the food. And every now and then, if my uncle wasn't available, my granny and I would do it. And she would drive and I would get out of the car and I would run the plates up to the porch. We didn't knock or anything. You just ran back to the car. <laughs> But most people in that community did not even like that man, much less love him. But my granny did. My granny always had extra food made at her house because someone inevitably would stop by. And most of the time that someone would stop by after we'd already put everything back in the refrigerator, which really made my little eyes roll up. Because that just meant I had to wash dishes again. <laughs> But she made sure that people were fed and knew that they were loved, even if it required a little more work for her and for the rest of us. These two people in my life were shining examples 
of Christians who loved God and loved God's people from their very center. They did not quit in hard times. They helped the needy. They made friends with nobodies. And they were hospitable to all. And they were people that I strive to be like. These are the people who showed me how to love God and how to love others. But you know, there are people in our lives who are looking to each of us to be those shining examples, to live lives with marks of true Christianity. A few years ago, and I wish I had written this down so that I had the full memory of it, but I didn't, so this is the story you get. Uh, a few years ago, we were somewhere, and probably a lot of you were there, because Rachel asks me, how do you know all of these people? Are you famous? It's like, well, I mean, church famous. <laughs> but the thing is, that so are you. Because if anybody in this community or in this world knows that you are here today, besides the people who are here today, you are church famous. Because people are looking to you. To be the example of God's love and God's grace. People know if you are here that you are supposed to share the love and the grace of God. That you love Jesus. That you follow Jesus. Because you are church famous too. And so what do, what do our words, our, our presence, our actions saying about Jesus? Are we sharing love from our very center? Because if you are church famous, then people are looking to you to see Jesus Christ in this world. And are you reflecting Jesus? Am I reflecting Jesus or are we just faking it? Do our words match our actions? Do our actions reflect what our words are supposed to be? Paul tells us to love from the center of who we are and to not fake it. And others are looking to us to see if we are going to treat them as a Christian is supposed to treat them. Are we living a life that has the marks of a true Christian? We have had... Um, some visitors with us for the first time in these um, last few weeks and months. And they're, they're coming to us for different reasons. Some are coming because their church closed and some are coming because their church closed to them. And I, I've changed what I've written to these folks if, um, if I know from where they came. <laughs> I usually write a little note that says, I hope that you're finding a, a warm and inviting place to fellowship and to worship. If you have any questions, let me know. But I've added a word. I hope that you are finding a warm, safe, and inviting place to worship. Because church should be a safe place. This should be a safe place. We should be loving from our very center. We should not be faking it. And we should have hospitality that invites people to see God's love and to experience God's grace. And to be sent forth in this world to share God's love and God's grace. And we should be warm and safe and inviting And last week I, I sent um, that email to a visitor who's been with us a couple times and they wrote me back and they said, I am finding First United Methodist Church to be warm and safe and inviting. Because we are church famous. We are. We are famous for being a place of love and a place of grace. 
And I want to be known as someone who loves from my very center. And I love that this church is known as a place of love and a place of grace. But if people know that you are here, they expect you to be a person of love and of grace. And so our words have to act, match our actions and our actions have to match our words. Sometimes my actions are good and my words are not. <laughs> Sometimes our words are strong but our actions reflect something else. But we are church famous. Each of us is church famous and our church is church famous. We are seen by this community and this world as followers of Jesus Christ. And I pray that what they see within me are marks of a true Christian. Because I want to love from my very center. I want people to recognize Jesus Christ in me. And I pray that your words and your deeds and my words and my deeds and our hospitality and our love is genuine. It's from our very center and will help others know the love and the grace of God.